to this uh, low energy operator. And uh, what I started to do at the very end yesterday was the final derivation of the ANEC. And I want to sort of gloss over some of the, so, it, so the, the rest, we put all the pieces into place now, like all the fundamental uh, things that you need to know are now in place. And I don't want to dwell on the technical details of the last bit of the argument too much. I'll just sketch quickly how you finish it up. Uh, the more important part is the, the building blocks that went into it anyway, and we have those. But let me just tell you how, you, how, how, the, how this ends. Okay, so uh, this is the correlation function we're going to look at. It's a four-point function, uh, but really O could be some, doesn't really have to be a local operator. It could be some superposition or some blob or multiple operator insertions. It's really a general operator. We're going to look at this four-point function uh, where we take, we're, we're thinking of these size as some kind of causality probe, and we're, we're asking the, the physical question, in the presence of these O insertions, can we send a signal faster than light from this psi over to that psi? Now this, notice these are space-like separated, so if we find that signal, then uh, we've violated causality. Uh, so, the first thing uh, that I want to do is to evaluate this four-point function using this OPE. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Evaluate. With the OPE. O, psi, psi, O. Uh, just gets a disconnected term, which I'll normalize to be one, and then a contribution from the null energy operator, so that's a V U squared O integral T U U of U from minus infinity to infinity O. Now, this expression doesn't quite make sense as written, because uh, we're doing, so what we're doing is we're taking these operators, these local operators, and we're replacing them, we're just deleting the local operators and we're replacing them by a non-local operator that's integrated over the null line between them. So we're integrating the stress tensor over that null line. Uh, but there's a singularity in that integral because like when it crosses this light cone, that three-point function is singular. And again, when it crosses this light cone, that three-point function is singular. So this expression doesn't quite make sense, but you can go through the, uh, all that I epsilon business that we discussed yesterday. Uh, the ordering of these three operators as written this expression tells you how to deal with that, tells you which I epsilon you're supposed to use uh, when you evaluate the integral. And if you go through that, then uh, what you'll find is there's a plus I epsilon up there and a minus I epsilon down there. So this just ends up being a simple contour integral where you can pick up uh, uh, the, a residue from circling one of these operators. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, I've dropped some, some constants here. There's a delta psi over CT, and there's probably some pi's and stuff, too, that I haven't written. Here, too. Now, if we had changed the operator order around, like this, then we would have gotten a different answer. So I've switched, I've switched two of the operators here. You can still evaluate this using the OPE, uh, and the expression is almost the same. Uh, except that the I epsilon prescription is different because we've 
switch some of the operators around. Uh, so in this case, you get a minus infinity minus i epsilon and a plus infinity minus i epsilon. You just, you just deform the contour a little bit. Uh, and when you do that, you, you no longer hit any of the, now you can close the contour below and it's just zero. Okay, so this is zero. This is just one contribution to the OPE. The correlator is not actually zero, of course, uh, but the point is that this, this term that we're interested in, this term that's, uh, that's small in the light cone limit, but enhanced by positive powers of u. You know, v is getting small, u is getting big. Uh, so this enhanced term is, is not present in this other correlator. Now, if we go back to what I was talking about yesterday, this is the one that's Rindler. This is the one that's positive uh, by Rindler reflections. Okay, so let's see why that is. Uh, so I've ordered them O psi, O psi. And remember we said that when, when things are reflection symmetric across the Rindler horizon, there's an ordering that's, that must be positive by unitarity. Uh, and the, the specific ordering was the one where you just order the things on the right and the things on the left in the same, you just write them in the same orders. Okay, so this is the Rindler positive one. And what that means is that this one is bounded by that one. Okay, so we're almost there. The last step is to use causality causality the statement about where this four-point function is analytic is a function of complexified space-time points. And if you have an analytic function, you can integrate it on a closed contour and get zero. I'll actually do something a little bit different, which is to integrate the real part of g minus one on a closed contour, which is still zero. We define u to be one over sigma, then the contour that I'm gonna pick looks like this. Okay, so on the sigma plane, it's, it takes, okay, it's, it's not easy to get a picture of this in Minkowski space, but I'll try. So if we go over to our Minkowski space picture, what this integral is doing is it's, it's integrating, it's in, so the, the straight part of that integral on the bottom, that's real sigma, so that's in regular Minkowski time. So this is the straight part. It's just integrating these points up to infinity like that. That's the, that's this part of the contour. And then the arc, the arc, um, sort of goes out into the complex direction out of the blackboard and connects the two endpoints. So the contour that we're doing uh, is it goes out to in, it goes down to infinity. It does this arc out like that, and then back to infinity. It's inside out because u is one over sigma. Compared to that one, this one is, is sort of inside out. So physically, uh, what this this is a this is a sum rule. This is a sum rule because you can in, you can break up the different pieces of the contour, and uh, they have to cancel with each other. And there's a lot of physics hiding in here because the different parts of this contour are capturing different 
very different physics. The, this part of the contour here is the, the top part. This is the V much less than U inverse, much less than one regime of the correlator. Uh, so there, you can use the light cone OPE. This is probing the infrared of the theory. We said the light cone OPE is, is, is um, given by low twist operators. So if you tell me the, the spectrum of low twist operators, then I can already calculate for you that light cone OPE. So this is really infrared. I don't need to know the details of the UV. Whereas down here, this is a limit where U and V are both much less than one, uh, but not in any particular, not in any particular ratio. So they could both, they could both be the same size. And down there, the OPE is no good. Because this part of the contour is really probing the UV. So we can't calculate anything on this part of the contour. Uh, but what we, and, and that means that this is relating something we know in the infrared to something we don't know in the UV. Uh, but, so we can't calculate anything, but we can bound it. Um, so the OPE is no good, uh, but on this part of the contour, uh, the integrand positive. The reason the integrand is positive is because the real part of G bounded by the absolute value of G. And we said that the absolute value of G in any ordering is bounded by the positive ordering. And we said that the positive ordering was just one. So the real part of G is less than one. Going a little quick with the the technical details, but, but hopefully the logic is clear. Uh, the logic is that in the infrared, we calculate things using the OPE. In the UV, we can't calculate anything, uh, but we can bound it by unitarity. So that's what's going, that's the input here. The input is unitarity in the ultraviolet. Yeah, infrared-ish. It's not really the infrared. So, it, so if we're doing a, if say we have a CFT that's deformed by a relevant operator, then you might think the infrared is some gapped phase or something. It's not that infrared. It's still controlled by the UV fixed point. Uh, I really mean infrared in the sense of uh, low dimension operators of the UV fixed point. Okay, so putting this all together, uh, what that contour integral says, is there a question? <laughs> um, yeah, good. So if we order, the, the two different orderings here can both be calculated using the light cone OPE. So both are the same expression, one plus the integral uh, but because of the ordering, there are different I epsilon prescriptions. And the, so there's a minus I epsilon minus and a plus minus. And the I epsilon prescriptions in this one don't, you just don't pick up any poles and you get zero. So putting this all together, uh, we have an expression 
uh, for the null energy in the presence of the O insertion, which is an integral of positive stuff in the ultraviolet. Now, O was totally arbitrary. So, uh, the only way that can be true is if this is a positive operator. This script E being the uh, null energy operator. So that's the end of the argument. Um, let me pause there for questions. Yeah. Uh, well, so they're, they're dense in Hilbert space. Uh, whether the fact that that's not quite the same as being the whole Hilbert space is an issue or not, I don't know. I'm just going to ignore that. <laughs> they're dense in Hilbert space. You, you, can, you can make any state by acting with operators and um, acting with... What? Yeah, but these are but but these don't really have to be local operators. I could have I could have inserted five operators here and five operators here as long as they're reflection symmetric. So that's what allows me to make basically any state this way. Other questions about the logic here? So let me let me recap briefly. So the so uh, physics in the light cone limit is controlled by the null energy operator and some rules which come from causality. So this is really, we, we use causality in an essential way here by using analyticity. Those some rules coming from analyticity relate this thing you can calculate on the light cone to unitarity in the UV. That's the logic. Uh, if if, the, if, if you say that NEG was, was violated, say that, say that you found a state where the null energy was negative, well, that would mean that somewhere in this domain here, the function is not analytic. So, uh, you know, if you, if you violate the sum rule, it means that you must have, well, either you have to violate unitarity in the UV, or you have to stick a singularity somewhere in here. If you put a singularity somewhere in here, then uh, what you've done is, is turned on a commutator where there's not allowed to be a commutator. So somewhere out here at very large u, uh, despite the operators being space-like separated, there would be a singularity and the commutator would turn on. Positive ultraviolet is something, the integral of something positive over the UV piece of the correlator. That's all I meant. Positive UV stuff. I want to briefly explain the relationship between this and some recent work on quantum chaos, and then we'll move on to talking about holography. So this is a paper from a couple years ago by Maldasana, Schenker, and Stanford. And uh, what they did is they studied Correlate, four point correlation functions in thermal quantum systems, they weren't, they weren't just doing quantum field theory. They were doing something very general that applies, that, that applies in condensed matter and just in quantum mechanics. But I'll tell you how it relates to, to, this, to this picture in quantum field theory. Uh, so to connect the two, 
Um, all we need to do is to reinterpret this picture as a thermal correlator. The, the Minkowski vacuum, we have a four, what we have here is a four-point function in the Minkowski vacuum. But the Minkowski vacuum is the Rindler thermal state. So we can reinterpret this four-point function in vacuum as a uh, thermal four-point function. It's the same calculation, it's just a different interpretation. Rindler coordinates are just U equals R E to the big T, V equals R E to the minus big T, where T is Rindler time. And now we're interpreting this as a thermal system at inverse temperature beta equal to 2 pi. Then this key contribution to the correlator that we've been talking about, which is 1 plus V u squared times the null energy, up to constants that I won't write, 1 plus r cubed, there's an e to the plus 2t minus t, so there's an e to the t. So when you reinterpret what's going on here. So what's going on is we, we, we take a null limit and then as we, as we, so let's think of this now as a thermal system. Then uh, these are just, this operator is just the same as that operator but, but shifted by uh, time to time plus i pi. So now um, we're, now this, this limit where we, go, where we go to large u is a late time limit in the sense of, of the thermal system, right? Because u, so u is getting big, so it's a late time limit from the point of view of thermal system. Uh, and what's happening is that, I guess I should write this with, if you, if you do this carefully with the constants, this ends up being a minus. So what we're seeing is that the correlator is just one, but then when you go to late times, it starts to, it starts to deviate. Ex, there's an exponential. Uh, R is tiny, so it's a small correction. But there's a, there's a tiny but exponentially growing contribution to the correlation function. And uh, this is the kind of thing that happens in chaotic systems. So in a chaotic system, uh, you have, if you have two very nearby, in a classically chaotic system, you have two nearby trajectories in phase space, then uh, if you wait a little bit, then they'll start to move apart from each other exponentially. And the, the exponential deviation between two trajectories in phase space is called the Lyapunov growth. In the context of quantum chaos, this exponential growth, which is e to some coefficient times t, in this case the coefficient is 1, that's interpreted as a Lyapunov exponent. Lambda 
equal to 1. Now the result, okay, so there's a, so there's a similar result that applies not just in Rindler space, but uh, in general thermal quantum systems, and that's the bound that was proved by Maldasana, Shanker, and Stanford. Uh, so what they, what they proved was, uh, you, can, you can say was a, was a constraint on this term, as, as well as constraints on how strong this growth can be. Now, I didn't talk about those, but some similar arguments to what I talked about also constrains how strong this growth can be. In fact, it can't be any bigger than one here. Into, uh, no, no, because it, it's, it's not literally the same. So the, the chaos bound that they derive is a bound on this number, and uh, the ANEC is a bound on, is a sign constraint on this number. But uh, if you go back to this contour that we were talking about a minute ago, uh, with a little more work, you can get both of those bounds from, from properties of that contour integral. Yeah, that's right. The Rindler, the Rindler situation is a very special case of the. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, just because I, I there, there are various constants here, and um, when we calculate the null energy, um, we have to evaluate it in the state O and everything, and when you when you do everything. Correctly with all the constants, it ends up being it ends up being a minus sign here. So, sorry. Oh, um, yeah. No, I. Well, okay, it depends which way we do the contour and everything. So, but there's, it, it has a particular sign and it's the one that works out to give you the, the correct sign and the yeah. null energy. Yeah. What? It's the same epsilon. The, the, it's hard to match the signs because they're eyes. So like uh, this, Yeah, let me not let me not try. There there are eyes in these expressions which are Yeah. Either the two lines it seems Well, but these were up to constants. <laughs> Why the Lyapunov is that? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, um. Yes. I, I don't know. I'm not sure what that means. Maybe it's related to what I'm going to talk about next. Um, so. Yeah. I don't know. Let's postpone this to the discussion. Maybe I can think about it before then. I, I don't think it's. The, the interpretation of this as 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 scrambling in quantum chaos is sort of trivial. Like it's it's just a it's really just the light cone limit. So. I don't. I know that there's much to learn from thinking of this in the thermal way. It's it's just another way of looking at it. Sorry. Oh, 
in, yeah, it's diff things are very different in two dimensions. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, everything changes in, in, in two dimensions. But what? The chaos bound? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure. So I want to move on to the next point of view on this whole business, which is the holographic point of view. And I'm roughly following Kelly and Wall from a paper in 2014. Before we get into it, uh, let me sort of tell you the, what the conclusion is going to be. It's going to be that in the light cone limit, uh, holography and the OPE are kind of the same thing. Uh, and every theory is sort of holographic, every conformal field theory is sort of holographic in the light cone limit. Not every field theory is truly holographic, but uh, things work exceptionally well in the light cone limit. So first, this is again going to be a causality-based argument. But now, it's not going to be a causality in quantum field theory argument. It's going to be a causality in quantum gravity argument. So we're going to use ADS-CFT to understand the ANEC. The first question is, what does causality mean in quantum gravity? That is not clear at all. OK, so locally, uh, what do we mean? You're not supposed to be able to get past, you're not supposed to go faster than the light cone. But what you mean by light cone depends on the geometry. What you mean by space -like sep whether two points are space-like separated depends on the geometry. What you even mean by a point at all depends on the geometry. It's not really clear what the rules are. At least locally, uh, I can't give you some simple criterion that says that you're not allowed to travel from here to here uh, in the theory of quantum gravity. There's nothing like that as far as we know. So we don't really know what causality means. There are other reasons to think we really don't know what causality means in quantum gravity. Uh, one is the black hole information paradox. So when a black hole evaporates, uh, if the information is to get out, that is a causal. I mean, if you draw the Penrose diagram, you have to have some kind of causality violation, at least non-perturbatively non in quantum gravity. Uh, so whatever the answer is, it must be something very subtle. But. We can say one thing, which is that in ADS, at the very least, it must respect the boundary causal structure. This is easiest to think about on a cylinder. I'll draw a nice big one. OK, so that's ADS. Uh, and suppose that you send a signal from the boundary of ADS. It goes through the middle, through the bulk. This is not empty ADS. There's stuff in here. 
here's some, maybe some black holes, maybe some stars, whatever in this ADS. It's asymptotically ADS. Uh, so it goes through. It eventually comes back and hits the boundary up here. Then if ADS CFT makes any sense, that signal better not violate causality of the boundary CFT. In other words, if we stick to the boundary of space-time and draw a null curve along the boundary, another null curve coming around the back of this cylinder, if we draw the, the boundary causal structure, the boundary light -like cones, then you better not be able to take a shortcut uh, by going through the middle. This is the boundary light cone. And if, I, if the boundary light cone makes it to here, and the path through the bulk makes it to here, the statement is then T should be greater than or equal to zero. Note that this only applies, at least in some obvious way, to signals that start and end at the boundary of ADS. If I send a signal from here to here, I can't say anything, just two points in the bulk. So what we're going to do is look at the propagation of signals very close to the boundary. And I'm going to do this in the Poincaré patch because it gets a bit hard to work with the cylinder. Uh, in the Poincaré patch, the setup is the following. So here's the boundary. We're going to have our usual uh, U and V directions, which are light cone directions on the boundary. Uh, but now we also have a, a direction coming out to the right, which is the bulk. Z direction. The metric, so this is ADS D plus one for a D dimensional CFT, and the metric of the Poincare patch is DS squared is one over Z squared minus DU DV plus DZ squared. plus, that, that would be empty ADS, and then we're going to add to that some matter, so plus some stuff, H mu nu, dx mu, dx nu. The statement that this space-time has the correct asymptotics, the statement that this is really ADS and not something else, uh, is the statement that H mu nu starts at order z to the d minus 2. Oh, I should have, I should have put on here also the, there, we're not just doing three dimensions. There's, we can do higher dimensions, so I'll put an x perp on there.
Okay, so we have a, so this is our metric. It's not, it's not a small, we're not working perturbatively. This is, arbitrarily, this is an arbitrarily large deviation from ADS, as long as it's asymptotically ADS. Uh, but notice that if, if we stay near the boundary where Z is small, then, then it's always a small deviation. Okay, so even though we're, we're considering arbitrary excitations, we can work perturbatively uh, in the metric if we stick to, the, to near the boundary of ADS. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to send a signal along this uh, line here in the U direction. Sorry, my picture is not so great. Does it make sense what that line is? So there's a, there's a plane on the boundary. We just went into the bulk a little bit and we're sending something parallel to the boundary uh, in the null direction. So this is a particle at fixed Z naught and X perp fixed z equals z naught, x perp equals zero. It, it's not a geodesic. You can work with geodesics, but we don't need to. You know, it's, it's not only particles on geodesics that have to obey causality. It's any particle that is on a, any particle has to obey causality, even if it has its own, if it carries a, a, a rocket along with it, it still has to obey causality. So we don't have to talk about geodesics. We could just talk about a causal curve, which I'll parameterize as V of U. So if we were in empty ADS, and this was just a, 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 a null geodesic pointing in this direction, then it would just sit at V equals zero. But in the perturbed metric, the light cones are bent a little bit, and, and we, have to change the, we have to change that a little bit. Now causality is, this, is gonna require The total delta V, which is like, this is the time delay, it's the deflection as it's as going this way, it has some deflection in the V direction. The total deflection, the V direction has to be positive. If the total, so it's, if you project this onto the boundary, it's sort of headed along this way, and it's getting, it can get delayed in the V direction, uh, but it can't get pushed forward. Now, I said a few minutes ago that we only have causality constraints if things hit the boundary. So you might be suspicious about this claim because uh, I never, I didn't send a signal from the boundary here. Um, but actually, you can't tell from this coordinate system, but actually this does hit the boundary because if you sit at fixed Z in the Poincaré coordinates, and then you go all the way to infinity in one of the space, in one of the boundary directions, that does hit the boundary. Okay, so it's hard to tell. It's easier to see on the, on the cylinder. So uh, this, is the, this is the path of um, that particle. And when you go all the way to, to U equals infinity, it's hitting the boundary up here. So this, bound, this causality, Criterion does apply to this curve because particle hits the boundary at u equals plus minus infinity.
Questions on the setup? I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, the uh, part of the unit box. Um, I mean, the what is because of that? My case, I need to. I mean, not, not all particles hit the boundary. So I, I, you can have a particle that just sort of bounces around in the middle. Not all particles hit the boundary. So it's important that we, we chose a path that does hit the boundary. So along this path, which we'll pick to be uh, just along the light cone, so ds squared is zero, and along this path, that's just one over z naught squared minus du dv, plus h u u d u squared plus higher order terms. These are the only terms that matter along the path. Uh, and so we can easily solve for the, for the light cone here. We just we want this to go along the light cone. Uh, then we should just pick the path where v prime of u is z naught squared H U U. So this is our this is our particle. This is the path of our particle, which is going as fast as possible, uh, which is which is going this way, and it's going as much it's deflecting in the v direction as much as possible according to the light cone and the bulk. So now we can integrate to get delta v the total time delay along the trajectory, z naught squared integral minus infinity to infinity, du h u u of u v equals zero, x perp. I've worked perturbatively here because we're working near the boundary. It's, it's, not the, it's not the smallness of H that's making this possible. It's the smallness of Z that's making this possible. Well, H is, H is small near the boundary. Is, this, is it clear what this quantity is calculating? So from a boundary point of view, we've sent a signal from here. So it's kind of way down near infinity, but we sent a signal from here. Uh, this is u direction. It's heading in the u direction, uh, but when the signal hits the, when it lands on the boundary again, it needs to land at positive, there needs to be a, a positive deflection in the v direction. Uh, so this has to be positive. Okay, so that's our, in gravitational language, that's our answer. That this path that we're talking about is causal uh, if and only if this integral is positive. Now I want to translate this into CFT language using ADS CFT. So ADS CFT says that the graviton H B nu in the bulk is dual the T mu nu 
in the CFT. For each field in the bulk, we have an operator in the CFT, and uh, this is the mapping for the graviton. And this geometry is dual with state with a state phi with some expectation value for the stress tensor. Okay, so if, if the graviton is dual to T mu nu, and we're talking about a, a geometry where the graviton is turned on, then that means we're talking about a CFT state where the stress tensor is turned on. And there's a well-known formula relating the two, which is just that the T in the CFT is D over 16 pi g newton times little t mu nu, where that was the leading term in the metric near the boundary. So if we take our expression for the Shapiro delay and translate that into CFT language, integral du, the integral of the metric perturbation, and you can see how it's going to turn out. That's just going to be the integral of the stress tensor. So this is the integral du, the expectation value of T u u CFT. of u, v equals zero, x perp equals zero, phi. And we said that this had to be positive according to causality, uh, this boundary causality criterion uh, for particles going through the bulk. That's exactly the average null energy condition. That's it. That was the whole argument. Okay, so part of the point to take away here <laughs> is that what took us one, two, two and a half hours to do from CFT took like 15 minutes to do from ADS. Um, this is a very general argument and, and it's and it's pretty easy. I mean, once you know what to calculate, you can prove the ANEC uh, in, in 15 minutes. Now, the uh, holographic derivation, you might wonder whether it's totally general, of course. Okay, so not all CFTs have holographic duals. Uh, certainly not all CFTs have some Einstein gravity living in ADS that describes them. Uh, but a, a, a rough statement, which I, I can't really make this statement totally precise, uh, but we'll see some ways in which it's true, uh, is that in the light cone limit, uh, all theories are holographic. That, that uh, in the light cone limit, when things are, another way of saying it is the following, if, if things are controlled by the OPE, that means, there's, that means they're being controlled by conformal invariance. And if they're controlled by conformal invariance, you might as well calculate them in ADS. Because uh, anything that you, if, if you calculate something in ADS and it's controlled by symmetry, then it's true not just in theories with an ADS dual, but in all theories, as long as it's something controlled by symmetry like these OPEs. Oh, 
I, uh, I think this is any dimension, although I can't remember if there, there might be something special that happens in three dimensions. I, I, I can't quite remember. I think it might be in any dimensions. Well, if there's non-unitary CFDs and causality is violated on both, unitarity is violated on both sides of the duality, causality is violated on both sides of the duality, and none of this has to apply. Okay. Um. Okay, I could start something new, but we have four minutes, so let's do. The question is, does this prove that non-unitary theories can't have a gravity dual? Um, cannot, right. Um, well, I think, I think that it can't have a consistent, it's not a consistent quantum, quantum theory, and it can't have a consistent gravity dual. <laughs> whether, whether, whether that you consider that a perfect match between inconsistencies on the two sides, uh, maybe there's a way of thinking of it that way. Gravity dual. Well, I said that particles in the in the bulk had to were constrained by the light cone. So I've assumed some consistency of the of the theory in the bulk in uh, writing down in solving this, solving this equation, this was a bulk calculation of where the particle is allowed to go based on the bulk light cone. So if you allow the bulk theory to be sick, then I don't know what the rules are here. Maybe we could just make V do whatever we please in the bulk and, and then we could get things to be violated on the boundary. I think near the boundary, the answer is yes. I think if you're, I think in some sort of approximate, some near boundary sense, the answer is yes. Um, I, I don't have a, maybe it's not yes in a completely precise way, <laughs> but it's yes in the sense that everything seems to match if you can, if you can do the calculations. And, uh, Yeah, it's really, it's only when, it's only when higher operators, so if you think of it as a field theory calculation, it's only when higher, uh, higher dimension operators and double trace operators start to enter your calculations, it's only then that you notice whether your theory is truly holographic or not. So as long as you do calculations like this that are only sensitive, say, to the stress tensor or the stress tensor two-point functions or even the stress tensor three-point functions, then you, you can't really notice that your theory is not holographic, so that the, the, the ADS calculations give you all the right answers. Okay, so we'll stop there for, oh, one more question. Yeah, that's right. So the question is, why does this work seem to work in ADS-3? I think it works in ADS-3. I'm not 100% sure of that. I have to think about that. Uh, but I would say the answer is that although in two dimensions our CFT, the CFT derivation that I gave does not work in two-dimensional CFT, but the ANEC is still true in two dimensions. So 
So it's okay if we can derive it from holography, uh, since it's still true, but, th but the derivations don't map onto each other perfectly.